give you a freebie this morning. We got here early. We're just going to do a, we're just do a course. Get in. Everybody's coming in. But George, but George, we're on our way. If you need the book, it's 489. I hope you don't need it. Let us stand. Let's, let's get our choice. Rejoice. do that again. Good morning. good morning. Oh, it's good to see everyone again this Sunday morning. Welcome to Williams. And if you happen to be a visitor this morning, a double welcome to you, but we would love for you to do something for us. If you look in the back of the bulletin, there's a little flappy sheet of paper. It says welcome on it. We would love to for you to fill that out so we can get a record of your visit and just rip it out, fold it up, and put it in the offering plate in a few minutes. Now, I do believe that Mr. Wallace has an announcement before I get started. You gonna come up here? I'll just do it from there. It's a thank you more than an announcement. The, this the outreach committee, we want to thank everybody that participated last week in the inviting someone to church. We feel like we tied the count. They thought we were speaking in tongues. <laughs> we counted over 300. So that was real good. And we can do that every Sunday if we'll make a little bit of effort. So well, thank you so much for participating in that. And it was a big success. And if you need any more signs, this wind last week broke a lot of them. We've got plenty in the back. There was some over here. If you need anything, tag or sign, see one of us, we'll give them to you. Thank you again for your help. Thank you, Wallace. All right, everyone, grab your bulletin and open it up. Okay, there are a few things that aren't in the bulletin that I need to talk to you about. Okay, um, there's a lot of stuff going on for Relay for Life. And if you would like to donate for that cause, if you can see Ashley Thomas. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Ashley Thomas, she's raising some money for Relay for Life for the JSU Nursing Center, correct? Okay, so see her. And also, Carrie wanted me to say that this Saturday at Walmart, they're going to have like a fun day for Relay for Life. So any of you that have kids, it would be great to send them. They've got a lot of activities planned for this Saturday. All righty. The uh, women's ministry kickoff supper is April 30th at 6.30, which is a Wednesday night. Oh, it's the 20th. I'm sorry. The 30th is something else. 20th. It's actually the Wednesday in, during Holy Week. And if you look in your bulletin, here's the list of things going on during Holy Week. And it has the correct dates. Um... So that Wednesday that we're not having service, all of you women, come and join us for the women's ministry dinner, supper, sorry. And that will be at 6.30. But we need to know if you're planning to come. So there are some sign-up sheets in the foyer or wherever there's a table, there should be a sign-up sheet. So get your name on there just so we know that you're coming. Um, JCOC, they're going to be participating in the Feinstein Foundation Challenge. And I hope that I said that correctly. But um, this foundation raises money and gives, I think, a million, one million dollars to nonprofit organizations that raise food for hunger in America. So they need our help to um, give mu uh, food or donations to JCOC by April 30th. That's where that 30 comes in. Alrighty, so 
they're going to receive um, a certain amount according to however much they raise, however much food they uh, have donated. So we need to help them by April 30th to get that in to the JCOC, which is behind McDonald's in Jacksonville. Um, tonight we have service at 6 o'clock. It will be in here in the sanctuary, and we will also have a quarterly business meeting afterwards, so just note that. And after that, we will have snack youth, okay? Just remember that. Um, next Sunday, after the service, morning service, I'm going to do the rent a youth time. Um, if you would like to have a youth come, do some odd jobs around the house, or you need a babysitter, come see me after church next week, and I'll get you set up for that. And I need to meet with the youth council and my youth parents shortly after the service. And I promise this is the last announcement. Butter braids. If you look on the back, oh, they're not on the back. They're on, if you had the doors open, you would see those delicious butter braids. And if you were able to taste them last week, you would have had your name on the sign-up list to get one. But just remember, you kiddos, that you have to sell your 15 butter braids by next Sunday. Okay? So if you you know, want one of them, see a little kid and get your name on the list. Alrighty, I did my yapping and now I'm done, so it's your turn to yap. Find some woman to say good morning to, or just show them some love and give them a hug, or kiss on the cheek, whatever. It says in the bulletin, uh, Darren Hamby, and I thought this morning that since he, everybody enjoyed him reading so much last week that I got the boot this morning, but they told me to, to go ahead anyway. And uh, So hear the word of the Lord, Psalm uh, 130, 5 through 6. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. See you. We're here to worship and to praise the living God this morning. It's all about Him today. It's all about Him. 253, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's peace and love. 253, stand with us, please, as we sing. Everyone join us, please.
God, we are standing on holy ground this morning in the presence of Jesus. Good morning as we share in the mission moments for the day. Obviously the word of God wants to be heard in the Psalms 135 through 6 because that's my scripture also except it's in a different um, reading so that uh, I've read it in three different versions or heard it in three different versions this morning. Listen as we read. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. CBF endorsed chaplain Polly Stokes Barnes served as a full-time hospice chaplain for the Odyssey Healthcare at Jackson, Mississippi. Barnes shares the spiritual journey with patients and their families in their homes, in nursing homes, and in hospitals. To face death is the last great challenge of all, and each individual faces this experience, his or her own life, differently. Let's pray that the Spirit will empower Barnes to listen sensitively so that she will be able to walk with these families through this powerful experience. Let's pause for a minute of silent prayer, please. In Jesus' name, amen.
no one has to be lonely. I was lonely until I met Jesus. He took me in and accepted me, made me become a different, better person. I could hear sorrow in his voice and the expression on his face. Somehow I knew he was going to die. Could his followers not see that? Or did they even care? Someone had to anoint him. So I gave him the most valuable gift, my perfume. No one has to be lonely. Jesus took me in. He can do the same for you. Good to see you all today. Remember, after we finish this, y'all have children's church, okay? So I want to tell you a couple things today. How many of you got to enjoy some birthday cake a while ago in the hallway? Did y'all get to do that? Some of you did? I think there's some, some birthday cake still left in there. Somebody asked me, why are we having a birthday cake? Well, we did it between Sunday school and church time. And one of the things we were doing was trying to celebrate the birthday of the CBF. Does anybody know what CBF stands for? Those are the three letters. What do those letters stand for, CBF? Does anybody know? Anybody? You know? You know what you know I'm going to say? <laughs> okay. All right. So C is cooperative. Can y'all say that? Cooperative? Uh, we'll see if we try a little better than that. C stands for cooperative. Ready? Cooperative. The B is for Baptist, all right? Baptist. And the F is fellowship. Fellowship. So let's say it all together. You ready? Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Okay? So today, where we were celebrating the 20th birthday of the CBF, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Well, what is the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship? Does anybody know about that? No. You probably have heard that before, but sometimes we forget about it. Most of the time when we think about the CBF or the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, it's because missionaries have come to our church. And we've had a lot of missionaries at our church over the last several years, and they all work through the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. So this is why I want you to think about it. If you have a birthday coming up, we would sing happy birthday to you. When we sing happy birthday, we would put your name in there, right? So if it's Caleb's birthday, we'd say happy birthday to Caleb, right? All right. Or if it was Maggie, happy birthday to Maggie, right? Be your birthday. And you would be how old at your next birthday? Thirteen, how old will you be? Eleven, okay. All right, what if we were to sing happy birthday to not just one person, to a whole group of people, like the church? So if we sing happy birthday to the church, we'd say happy birthday to Williams, right? First Baptist Church of Williams. And you know how old this church is? Does anybody know? It started in 1850. So somebody's good at math. How many years is that? Does anybody know? 1950 is 100, and then 50 more years is 2,000. So it's 150, and this is 2011. Huh? 161. Can you imagine having a birthday cake with 161 candles on there? That would be, the fire marshal would close down the church if we tried to light all those candles, wouldn't it? Okay? Um, so let's say we decided we wanted to do that, though. We wanted to sing happy birthday to our church, and it was to a whole big group, right? And somebody would say, well, what's the church? And we'd say, well, it's all these people, and we're trying to serve Jesus, and we worship, have Bible school, and all this kind of stuff. What if a bunch of churches all got together to try to do things for Jesus around the world, places that our church by itself couldn't do? Well, that's what the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship is. It's a cooperative, it's a bunch of churches going in together as Baptist churches, to have fellowship around mostly doing mission work around the world. So we sang happy birthday today, and we had that cake, and there's still a few pieces left over, so after church, you'll want to go get you some. You probably can. 20 years in CBF, and today our speaker is going to represent CBF in our state of Alabama. Okay? So I just want you to think about that and know that every Sunday morning we read stories like Miss Diane did about missionaries that work with CBF. We want to pray for them, and you're going to be learning a lot about CBF missions as well. Here's the other thing. We're doing a verse a month, and we all did John 3.16, right? Y'all remember that one? Y'all did so well with it. 
So I've got some cards. I'm only doing 30 cards, but if we need more, we can. And I'm going to give you a card today. We've got a new verse, okay? It's Luke 6, 31. Luke 6, 31. And it says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Some people know this is the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them to do to you. And it's pretty easy, I think, to remember. I think all y'all can remember. And this is for any kid from as young as you can think of through sixth grade. Okay, so I'm going to give you one. And in the month of April, we're just doing it for one month. If you will remember this, if you'll write your name on there and your parents' name that you remembered it, I'm going to give you a little prize because I just like giving y'all prizes anyway. Okay, so it's good. We're going to try to learn a verse every month. Okay, so this is our verse. It's Luke 6.31. Y'all think we can try to say it together? <coughs> do to others as you would have them do to you. Let's try it one more time. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6.31. Okay? Y'all think y'all can remember that this month? And at the end of the month, then I'll ask you again. If you got your card, you can see me anytime. Your parents can give it to me or whatever. As long as I get the card with your name on it, then I'll give you a little prize, okay? All right? I'm proud of y'all. Y'all are so smart. I know y'all can do this. So y'all remember we got Children's Church? We'll give you a card before you go, okay? And y'all have a good time. All right, let's pray. All right, here we go. I'll take some cards and you can go. <laughs> What a great sight. So parents, I hope that you'll help them as they learn their Bible verses and be sure to get that back to me for them, okay? Well, as you heard in Children's Story, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of CBF. Oh, daddy. <laughs> and one of the things I wanted you to do is have the privilege of meeting our new coordinator for Alabama CBF. He's Ronnie Brewer, and Ronnie and Janet are here. They're good friends of Mary and me, and we've uh, enjoyed getting to know them through the years. It meant a lot to me uh, personally. Ronnie uh, at one time was campus minister, actually two times, I guess, campus minister, and was campus minister of the University of Alabama for a while, and also pastor of uh, Trinity Baptist Church in Madison, Alabama. Most recently, we called him to be our coordinator for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship in Alabama, and I was fortunate enough to be on that search committee. We had a lot of great applicants for that job, uh, which made me feel really good about CBF, but uh, we just felt the Lord leading us to Ronnie, and I think he felt that call to this part of the ministry, and I'm very, very glad about that. Ronnie's doing an excellent job, and I want you to have an opportunity to hear him preach and be before us today, and after church, get a chance just to meet him and Janet. I'm glad that you made the trip down here. Janet's a librarian, and uh, I know has a busy week, so your weekends, driving to Williams, I hope you have a great day today. I'm glad y'all were here. So welcome them in a few moments after the choir sings. Would you come up and lead us with our message today? Thank you, Ron. The offer to her hand for the morning is 198. Wonderful grace of Jesus. We're standing and sing the first and the last stanzas. Join us, please. 198.
I was just looking out thinking how long I've known you. You may not know me, but I've known your church for a long time. I've been here before. I, I did a revival here when Barry was here. But I've known you going back to the John Tadlock days. Some of you are smiling. I know your story. I know who you are. And I'm glad to be with you. This is a heroic church. This is a community church. I watched these children pile up here this morning and the diversity of ages in this church. And to see this group of young people who have to sit under the preacher right here on Sunday morning, you're in church, and I'm glad. It's good to be with you. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about CBF this morning. Sometime Mike's going to ask me back, and I'm going to get to talk specifically about what we do as a community of churches in Alabama together and why we think it's important that we have a CBF and all of that. But I can streamline that. I can give you the cliff note version of that this morning, that I think the word cooperative is the most important word in our family name. 
that it's not good for churches to be isolated and alone and that we do better when we pool our resources together. So the title of this sermon is When Little Becomes Much and what it means to work together. I think it's important for us to do many things together as churches and Baptist churches that have similar values and ways of looking at things, but especially to do missions together. We're so much stronger when we do things together. So let me read the scripture this morning and then preach briefly. And I know Bob Ford comes in here and preaches in 10 minutes, so I've got a hard act to follow. I, don't, I probably won't be able to do that, but I'm going to work at getting you out at a good time. This is John chapter 6, and it's the story of the little boy and the fish and the loaves. And it's probably top five of what people say their favorite Bible verses are. And you get in a fight in a Baptist church asking people favorite verses. So I've listed some. Some of you love the prodigal son better than any other text in the scripture. Some of you love the good Samaritan, and you live your life that way. Some of you love the best, the rich young ruler, which is a hard passage. Feeding of the 5,000 always seems to make that list. So let me read to you John's version of that. After this, Jesus went across the lake. A large crowd followed him because they'd seen his miracles and the healing of the sick. Jesus went up on a hill and there sat down with his disciples. And the time for the Passover festival was near, and Jesus looked around and saw a large crowd was coming to him, and he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip because he knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to even have a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread for this crowd. Another one of the disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, but there's a boy here who has five loaves of bread and two fish. But they will certainly not be enough for all these people, Jesus. Make the people sit down, said Jesus. There was a lot of grass in this place. And so all the people sat down. The men alone numbered 5,000. Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he gave thanks to God, and then he distributed it to all the people who were sitting there that day. He did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. And then when they were all full, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces left over so that we don't waste any. And so they gathered them all and filled 12 baskets with the pieces left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. And seeing this miracle that Jesus had done, people said, surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Bow with me for prayer, if you would. God, help us to hear this passage once more, maybe in familiar ways, where we're reminded that we need to offer who we are and what we have to Jesus. Maybe to help us think a little deeper about doing that together, to finding other people that we can work in community with to help Jesus. But help us to hear with fresh ears and open heart this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't have to tell this church much about doing missions, do I? You are the most intentional CBF missions church in the state of Alabama. I'm just saying that here. That's going out across the world wide web. I may make some other churches mad. You do a CBF missions moment every Sunday morning. You've been doing missional things ever since I've heard of you and known you. And maybe 160 years since you've been around. I don't know, but you're missions people. So what I'm going to be saying this morning is just a reminder, and it's not really going to be anything new for most of you, but I hope that it will renew us to look at ways that we can do work with Jesus together. Now, the cliff notes of the sermon would be this. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus can provide what anyone needs anywhere, anytime. Jesus is the center of this story. But if I went further with the story, I would say he does want partners to help him in his work. He allows us to. He calls out our gifts and what we have and wants us to be openly offering them to him. And then he blesses it and makes a miracle out of it for a needy world. That's the cliff notes for the sermon. One of the reasons we love this passage so much is we can see it. It's a visual passage. Don't close your eyes because you may go to sleep. I've already told a couple of you I'm going to call your name if you go to sleep. But I want you in your mind's eye 
to think with me about this passage a moment. Can you see that hillside? Can you in your mind see the lake? Some of you have been there. Others of you have seen it either on TV or in pictures. Can you see the lake there in Galilee? Can you see this crowd? The Bible says there's much grass in that place. If you've been to Israel, that's a big deal. There's not much grass anywhere. But for this beautiful hillside along the lake, there they all are that day. We can almost see it. They're excited because they want to hear the main character of the story, Jesus. Jesus grew up there. It wasn't like Jesus was new to some of them. Jesus grew up probably not a good stretch of the legs away, maybe between here and Jacksonville. He grew up over the hill and then had hung out right at the lake there in Capernaum when he was a young adult, most likely. So in that small town community world of Galilee, a lot of people knew who Jesus was. They just didn't really know. And they started seeing his authority and his miracles, and they were gathering from everywhere. Now, on that hill that day, in your mind, I want you to see this. Not just neighbors in the community that knew each other that gathered with Jesus. You had people that probably crossed the lake from Syria who were mortal enemies with the people who lived just across the lake from them in Galilee. But word had spread and they came to hear Jesus. People from everywhere. And then other characters in the story we love to hear about we kind of run right by the crowd sometimes, but don't run by the crowd. The crowd was needy. The crowd was hungry. I mean literally hungry in this world. They were poor. So getting a meal was a big deal, but they were hungry spiritually, and they were oppressed. They were a slave people, a lot of them. The disciples were there, and when we see the disciples in one of the gospel stories, the disciples represent us. So church, we're supposed to connect with the disciples. What were they doing and thinking that day that was not so good? What could they have done better that Jesus would have wanted them to do? And what are we supposed to learn from that? That day, those disciples are a little bit nervous. They're a little bit over-controlling. They're a little bit overwhelmed by having to feed this crowd and probably didn't want to mess with it. And they were frightened. They were there that day, and we don't want to run by them. And then there's this boy. How do you picture in your mind that little boy in this story? I, I sort of picture him around 12 years old. I don't know why. A boy, a 12-year-old boy, fidgety, just a boy. And I've never been able to get beyond this great theological question of this story, and maybe this is my own way of thinking. I've never believed for one minute that that little boy was the only one who brought a lunch there that day. You ever thought about that? I know little boys. My son could hardly keep up with his lunch box or his backpack. He didn't plan out things when he was 12. Somebody put a lunch in that boy's hand, and in that day and time when people traveled long distances, how did they get there? They walked. If you were going to hear Jesus, you would have walked from Jacksonville, let's say, to come here to he hear him. And here's a news flash. When they walked from, say, Jacksonville to the Williams community, there were no places to stop food along the way. In Jesus' day, there were no Hardee's, no Taco Bells, not even Quick Marts, where you could run in and eat if you were hungry. If you ate, you planned to eat. Are you following me? I don't think the Bible says one way or the other if this little character is the only one who brought a lunch there that day. I think there were others. Because I know humans will think about eating. I think he was the only one that offered. And then there's the miracle in the story. And here's the process. Jesus sees the need. The disciples try to over control. And he commands them, sit down. Take a break. I want you to watch this is the language of the scripture. You're not in charge right now. I want to show you something. 
And they had scoffed about the little boy's offering into the mix, probably thought it was cute, even ridiculous, and they smiled about it. I don't picture Jesus smiling. I don't picture him angry. But I picture him in command as he sits the people down, and then he blesses what that boy offers. That's a key part of the story. Jesus takes the little, and he blesses it. And what does it become? Much. He had a helper, and he wanted a partner, and he wanted that partner to work with the community that was gathered around, and he showed them something. When you offer what you have and pool it together, watch what I can do with it. Do you see the story? Now, two or three mission points that I have that this morning I want you to hear out of the story. There are others, but these are the things I thought about as I think about us pooling our resources to work together for Jesus. Churches that want to be that kind of church, that want to cooperate with other churches to do bigger things in God's world, first and foremost, always have to keep Jesus at the center of their story. We can get off track doing good things sometimes, and I like to do good things. Church needs to keep what Jesus wants it to do in the center of its mission. Preach Jesus. Teach Jesus. If you get lost along the way in the Bible, go back to Jesus and let him help you find your way out. If there are passages in the back or the front that get you confused, they can always be worked out by going back to Jesus. And that's what the church does. We center our mission in Jesus. And that means sometimes, church, we have to do like the disciples. We have to take a time out every now and then as a church and sit down and listen. Maybe that Sunday morning for you. Maybe that Sunday night when you have your worship. Maybe that's in missions teaching or Bible study. And I hope and pray it's in some quiet time you have along the way. But church, there sometimes we need to sit down and listen to Jesus. What would he have us to do? And I think that is intentional. Young person, Jesus is calling you to do something. Every one of you. All of you. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it will be vocationally. I don't know what it will be long term but I know God has something for you to do in partnership with him and his world. But I also know the only way you will ever know is if you intentionally listen. You can block him out, and you cannot listen, or you can be still and sit down and know that he is calling you to offer what you have to a bigger world and to bless it and to use it. Adult, you don't get off the hook either. God is always calling us to new things. Sometimes in churches, we go for years without doing new things. Old things are good, but when God calls to new things, if we're not listening intentionally, we won't know them. And then working together to do those things takes an intentional plan. I was in a church last Sunday and preached on their missions Sunday, First Baptist Church, Auburn one of our Alabama CBF churches. And they're a lot like Williams. They are a mission church. They have a plan. They have a missions budget. They have money that they talk about and plan and use for missions, and they know where that money's going. They have missions education, like you do in your church. They teach missions, study missions, keep people's minds on missions. They are intentional about missions. They have hands-on stuff for people to do in the Auburn community. They don't just talk about helping in Japan, which is a great thing. They work in their community like you do with the school and other things that you do in this community. They have a plan, and that's the way we stay on track with Jesus' mission. Third thing I wrote down, there is a mystical quality when we work with Jesus now, here's the bottom line. If we overanalyze Jesus, we're probably not going to do real well with him. 
if we want to tell him what to do, we don't usually do real well with him. There is a letting go and allowing God to guide when the community of believers does missions. There's an individual letting go where you take those fish and loaves in your life and you offer them to God in front of everybody in the community. And there's where the community lets go and decides that it will trust and follow. But that's a mystical thing. I wish I could give you another word. I'll not be famous for being a mystic. I, I, I like seeing things and I like planning things, but at the end of the day, some of the most wonderful things that have ever happened to me with Jesus is when I didn't have to control and I could let go and serve. I bet some of you know what I'm talking about. Fourth, I think Jesus is always calling disciples, church, to work in community. You read the Gospels, and story after story is where Jesus is putting people together. First, two by two, disciples went out. Then he started connecting disciples to serve, and then the church was born the called out ones, the ones who were called into community to serve together. Jesus is real big on working together. There's a good Methodist that said, there's no such thing as a solitary Christian life. When John Wesley said that, he was right. There's no such thing as being alone and being a Christian. You cannot isolate yourself and be a Christian. And I don't believe and maybe this is being a good Baptist. I don't believe there's such a thing as a solitary Christian church. I think we're supposed to work with others. I think we're supposed to cooperate with others and pool our resources together. You know, I've, I've watched like you have what's going on in Japan, and I'd like to help, and I, I've tried to. I've texted my money. I have sent my money through CBF, actually, through what we're doing, but, but whatever you've chosen to do, and that's great, I can help that way, but how much more could I help if I joined forces with you and we organized and communicated a plan where we decided that at least the 30 churches in Alabama would try to make some kind of difference in Japan? How much is that true in anywhere you want to point to in the world, in the country, or in the state that I can do more pooling my resources with you than I can ever do alone. And that 30 congregations can do more in the world together than just one alone. And I think that's an important thing that Jesus calls us to. We are not Lone Ranger Christians. We're called to be community. And last, this thought. I've already given it away, but if Jesus is calling you, and he is, to do something in his world, don't sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. Don't sit back and wait for it to pass. Don't try to overthink it to death. Don't be afraid of it. Offer who you are and what you have and watch what Jesus does. That's kind of a plain point in this story, isn't it? But isn't that exactly what this boy does? I can imagine his parents there that day. Where did he go? Oh my, he's up there with Jesus. Go get him honey before he embarrasses us all. He's got his lunch thinking Jesus is going to feed everybody with his lunch. The boy really showed something that sometimes we get lost in. We can become insecure sometimes about offering what we have to Jesus. Now, some of the folks there that day were selfish. If they had a lunch, they weren't going to offer it up because they were going to eat it. And if they offered it up, somebody might get theirs. And I get that. We live in a world like that. But I also imagine that some people there saw the need and might have liked to have helped, but were a little too insecure. This is really not enough, or somebody else may have more, or what will somebody think, or somebody can do it better. And the story teaches us if we're going to follow Jesus in the way that we should, we just offer what we have, and we don't wait for somebody else to do it. Well, here's your touch points for this story today. Maybe today in worship it was just a good day to sit down 
and think about what Jesus wants you to do. Maybe it's a good day in church for you to realize, you know, I do have things in my life that Jesus can use. And I need to be willing to offer them. Maybe it's a good day to remember we really do work better when we work together and when we can pool our resources with Jesus to see what can happen. I would just encourage you, don't hold back. Who you are and what you have in your life is good enough for Jesus. Offer it. Watch him bless it and make a miracle out of it. You've been doing that a long time in some ways as a church. I guess my charge to you would be to continue to be the kind of church that works together and with others in God's world. Let's pray together. God, sometimes we look out at need in the world and it just looks so big. How can we really help something so big? And this story teaches us that we are called to offer what we have and who we are and then to trust. And so we ask that you would help us to renew that this morning individually and as a church as we seek to serve you in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Especially that story of the little boy and the loaves, the fish, and the rock of Jesus, and what Jesus was able to do. Uh, Ronnie was talking about the popularity of that story. It's the only story I think that's told in all four gospels, uh, apart from the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, must have meant a lot to the early Christians to do that. I hope that you'll respond today as you come forward. If you'd like to, you can come and share uh, at the time of prayer. If you want to share a decision that you have on your heart today, maybe to join our church or accept Christ or to say, I'm ready to commit more and be a part of what God's doing. I invite you to stand now in this opportunity for invitation. In 350, just so sweet to trust in Jesus. 350.
she came by to see me this week, and the Lord had just been dealing with her for a while, I think. And she came by, she said, if I see the truck there, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, we drove this morning, and I think every deacon has to have a truck, because there were seven. <laughs> so if I knew the deacons, at least we're going to be at church this morning. But she saw my truck, she stopped, I'm so glad you did. Had a great time to pray with her and talk with her about her decision, and she wants to be a part of Williams. Officially, we'll set up a time for baptism at some point in time. Okay? All of you in favor of that, accepting her as our fellowship, please say amen. 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 And I'm going to ask her to come. John, would you come stand with her in a moment? And uh, her husband, and after the service is over, if you would, just come by, offer her the hugs and the fellowship that you can do as the people of Williams. Let them know both how glad you are about her decision, John. Congratulations. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to ask Ronnie, if you would, to just come back over as we dismiss today. We have our Lord's Prayer. That will be our benediction. And we'll look back to Ronnie. Sure. Father, we For our benediction, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.